Dan, one of the sectors that we see which is uh, already experiencing uh, peak fossil fuel demand is the power sector, where uh, the renewables have now ca are capturing almost all of the growth. And your colleague, a Kings Mill Bond, said something to me a couple of years ago that has, uh, I think is coming true, which is that first renewables will take the growth. Once they've taken 100% of the growth, then you'll see them start eating into the existing consumption uh, of, you know, uh, on say gas and coal and the generation of electricity. Um, would you agree that those we're seeing those trends? Yeah, exactly. Right. I think we need to again, uh, we need to look at this transition um, through decadal lenses. If we want to make uh, predictions about decades into the future, we need to look decades into the past to understand what's happening here. So if we go a few decades back. Basically, all electricity demand growth came from fossil fuels, effectively. I mean, there's some hydro, some other sources, but by and large, it was fossil fuels driving the growth. Then about, you know, uh, 10 years ago, we start seeing a serious, like a significant part, a couple percent or a 10 percent of this electricity growth coming from wind and solar um, and, and, and growing and growing. Then we are now, five years ago, we're in a situation where about roughly half of the growth is coming from uh, uh, wind and solar. We are now in 2025, the first half of 2025, in a moment where 100%, actually 110%, I believe it is, of growth is coming from wind and solar. And this curve, of course, is going to continue where solar is now going to, solar and wind are now going to outpace demand growth. And that means, of course, the decline of fossil fuels. As you outpace growth, you can actually eat into the total demand. And so this movie, what we're looking at is, a, is one where wind and solar went from 0% of growth maybe 20 years ago to now all of the growth 20, 20, 25 years later. And now the question is, if you look at that trend, what do you expect to continue? And I think at the moment we have two narratives there. One is, you know, I'm sure the Chinese solar players and the wind and solar developers are going to sort of play fair and very drastically slow down their growth rates to only ever match the growing electricity demand to leave all the fossil players with nice profit margins underneath. That's narrative one. Narrative two is, of course, this is going to continue after taking all the growth but having the manufacturing capacity build up to do much more, having the skills built up and the economics behind you to eat much more of the market, you're going to continue growing. And this is, I think, exactly what we're going to see over the next couple of years pan out, is that first the hare catches up to the turtle, and now the hare and the turtle are at the same level. And of course, the next time step, the hare is going to overtake the turtle. And that's logically, I think, what we're going to see, see happen right now. We're now at this sort of snap, so, uh, snapshot point where it seems like, oh, renewables are only taking all the growth. But that's because that's an achievement that we just achieved after only taking half the growth five years ago and 0% of the growth like 20 years ago. And so as the story continues, I only expect renewables to grow. And given the fact that you and I live in North America and uh, uh, the West in general hasn't really caught on to this yet, and there's a reason why, and I see it most, you know, in my work, I see it uh, most obviously in the OPEC modeling, uh, because OPEC is very, very clear. It says, yes, in the global North, we'll see a very slow decline of fossil fuel consumption and a very slow rise of, of clean electricity coupled with uh, electrotech. That's going to happen. We admit it. You know, we're going to see EVs take a bar. It's the global south where they make the mistake. OPEC says very clearly that, uh, that electrotech and renewables are too expensive. Governments in, in the global south aren't prepared to, don't have the cash to subsidize it. Therefore, we're going to see all the growth in oil and gas uh, in, in the global economy in the global south. And of course, what have we seen over the last two or three years? Exactly the opposite. The global south is leapfrogging over fossil fuel development, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and devices and going straight into electrotech and, and renewables. And, and China is, is a big driver of that. That, I think, is the fundamental error that we in the West make when we're conceiving of how this energy transition is playing out. Yeah, it's a, it's a Western mindset of thinking that the uh, emerging economies are indeed like emerging as in they're just copying whatever the developed economies are going to do. So it's, it's a projection. If it goes slow with us, surely it's going to go even slower there. 
Uh, and we're just seeing that that sort of that expectation absolutely being destroyed at the moment with leapfrogging left, right, and center. So, I mean, my two two favorite data points there is uh, 63% of emerging markets have overtaken the United States in terms of solar adoption. That is like the share of electricity coming from solar is higher than in the US. Uh, a quarter of emerging economies are more electrified than the US economy. So this is a rapid leapfrog. And by the way, these are not statistics that, you know, are, are this is all very new. This is not something that happened like 20, 15, 20 years ago. These are all things, these leapfrogs all happened over the past decade or so, probably a little bit less. As these economies continue to electrify and continue to develop cheap uh, electricity, which is renewable electricity, uh, they continue to leapfrog uh, the West. And this is, of course, completely subverting the underlying assumptions in many of the like large energy outlook models that kind of see energy as a progressive ladder where you go from biofuels to coal to oil and gas. And then maybe if you're very rich to renewables. Um, but uh, the, the, the global south is taking a shortcut and they're going straight from uh, primitive energies in coal and now a bit of oil and gas straight into renewables without going to the sort of crazy peaks of what is in the US 80 gigajoules of oil, oil per capita. Uh, China peaked at, uh, at an order of magnitude less at eight gigajoules per capita and it's on the decline right now. So we're seeing that, you know, countries can take a shortcut towards development, towards uh, renewables. Um, and that's completely upending uh, the way that we look at fossil fuel demand futures. There was an article that came out uh, not too long ago, and by not too long ago, I mean last week, that argued uh, part of our problem is we're looking at the future through very old modeling uh, or th very uh, old energy demand models. Uh, and and this shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, all, I you know all of the governments, the agencies, the firms that do modeling, they have these computer models and they feed data and in, you know inputs and assumptions into it, and, and it spits out uh, these uh, the model the scenarios. And sometimes in the shorter term, they'll do they'll do forecasts, you know, two to five years. And uh, Michael Lieberg, who started Bloomberg uh, NEF. Uh, you know, 2009, he said, Markham, we sold our model to the IEA so they could integrate it. And he said, I got to peek under the hood of the IEA model. And he said, they were so afraid of modeling out, you know, rapid adoption of solar, rapid adoption of wind, that they, they programmed in stops so that every two years, you know, instead of having this, you know, very exponential growth, the growth tapered off. And it's not because that, that that's a realistic assumption. It's It was basically a political decision uh, built into the model uh, so that it wouldn't upset the members who are primarily pro fossil fuel uh, producers. And so when you, when you get it into this world a little bit, you soon realize that people's perception of how this is taking place is not shaped by the, the data and, and experience, it's basically shaped by a lot of narrative and a lot of these the modeling exercises based on old models. I agree. I mean, so I, I did a lot of modeling in, in, in my life. I built lots of energy models for companies and, and countries. And I think one of the things that people just get wrong about modeling is that modeling is narrative, right? Writing a good model is like writing a good novel. It is realistic characters, it has realistic boundary conditions, and it propagates it in a realistic way. But we need to understand that all models are fiction, of course. And you have good fiction that teaches you something about the world. You have bad fiction that just is completely made up uh, unhelpful. And I think we have modeled the world in sort of our old sort of Weltanschau and in our old way of looking at things in a very convincing way. And that has largely been correct because obviously also we invest in the future that we believe that will happen. So we, we hear a model saying there's more oil and gas, we invest in more oil and gas, and then the model comes true because we, we invest in it such a way. And we're seeing that, that very thing now being upended. Um, to, to stick a little bit with this sort of modeling analogy here, I think another um, good way to look at it is that we've had some very great successes modeling the energy economy in a near stasis state, like in a non-rapid disruptive state. It's a bit like modeling a gas in steady state in physics, right? But what happens when you get an explosion somewhere or something rapid happens, you get non-, non uh, uh, like you get dynamic uh, thermal uh, thermodynamics 
uh, you get non-equilibrium um, um, equations. And all of a sudden, even in physics, we can't really fully solve those equations. It becomes very hard to actually understand what's going on in a gas, in an explosion, and this kind of stuff. So it's quite hard to fully grasp what's going on there with simple rules. And so we've, I see the same thing happening now actually in um, uh, macroeconomics of energy is we've been become very good at kind of describing the steady state version of the energy system where everything changes just with 0.1% from one year to the next. And it's quite successful that. But of course, those models break down the moment we go into a non-equilibrium state. And that's, I think that's what we're entering right now with the energy sector. And while we just plainly need new models and, and in, my opt in my view, simpler models, that don't every time are sort of very exact with a billion factors, but they get it exactly wrong. Uh, I'd rather just be approximately right. Uh, we actually have a little experience with that at Energy Media because we have our own energy transition theory of change. Because we're journalists, we're not modelers, we're not mathematicians. Uh, what we do instead is we work with the you know the technology adoption S curve, and we look we use uh, Clay Christensen from Harvard Business uh, School his ideas of innovative disruption. So, so technologies that disrupt industries and disrupt individual business models. And we look for those industries where technology is already being disrupted. The automotive industry is the most obvious example right now. And then we trace the effects of that disruption. And given the data, we compare it to the assumptions in the other models. So we'll look at, you know, uh, OPEC assumes that... Uh, that uh, oil and gas demand in the global south will will be slow and and steady and so on a year by year basis you can look at that data and then compare it to their assumptions and you can do the same for the IEA and for the US EIA and so on and you say which based on that which modeler and which of their scenarios are more likely to come true and based on the work we've done so far the, I, the International Energy Agency's APS scenario, which shows peak in 2030 and decline in the early 2030s, is the most likely scenario because it lines up best with the data. And I've, I've found that a very useful way to approach this because we're not, we're not modeling ourselves, we're checking the, the, the models against the actual data that is released on a regular basis. I very much appreciate that, Mark. And I think this is exactly what one of the things that the energy modeling community misses is just proper backtesting, right? It's it's nice to write an energy model of the future, but let's take those same assumptions and go five years back and see if you actually can predict what is going to happen. And that's, of course, where time and again, you get those famous charts of the underestimation of how fast uh, electrotech is growing. Uh, these models just don't backtest test very well. Um, uh, and of course, funnily enough, these S curves uh, do backtest quite well. And it's a very simple, even just simple exponential curves tend to backtest better than all these very complex models. Um, and again, that's not because these models are wrong or something, but that's because we're just entering a new state of physics here, right? We're entering a new state of market economics uh, where it's disruptive and it's a technology rather than a commodity that is coming in. So it's a, it's a whole new restructuring of the system. It all goes through electricity and electrons rather through molecules that can be stored. Obviously, you know, models that are trained on the old system will have, you know, a lot of trouble with modeling the new system. Um, and, and so I think it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's not just uh, if we talk about stranded assets, it's not just the, the physical oil and gas assets that are stranding, but we get a whole range of models and experts that are stranding with it. And that's, I think, another thing that we need to deal with in the community right now is that we have a large stranding of thinking about energy that is just no longer relevant for the modern age. And, and it's not that it was all nonsense all along. It's just that we're entering a new phase where we need to evolve our, our thinking and we need to evolve, evolve our expertise and what we call an energy modeling expert. I'll close the interview this way, Dan. Um, the, um, the technology adoption bell curve is very well known. It's been around, A.E. Rogers uh, came up with it in 1962, and it's very famous. And we know the language, the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority adopters at the beginning of the left side of the, the bell curve, and then over here on the other side are the laggards, right? And, you, and any technology goes up and around the bell curve until finally it gets to the laggards and then it dominates the industry. Uh, but here's the point. It also works for ideas. And people like you and your team over at Ember Energy are the innovators and the early adopters. And why would we be surprised that there are uh, laggards in this conversation? 
or late majority adopters in this conversation who are debating with the innovators and the early adopters. It's exactly how it, we would expect it, but it has implications for what, how economies respond, how countries respond to dis the disruption that comes with this energy transition. And if you're going to be a laggard in this conversation, you are going to lose out to the innovators and the early adopters. So on that note, uh, uh, Dan, thank you very much. We'll look forward to the next interview. Thanks, Marco.